Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. As that video points out, we human beings have a special relationship with stuff, especially if we think it's our stuff. It's so central to our lives, in fact, that we decided it was a worthy topic for our sermon series that we're calling Wisdom for Life. In this sermon series, we're taking several issues that all of us deal with from time to time, and we're looking at them from a biblical perspective. We have so far looked at anger and suffering and purpose, and today we're looking at stuff. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to uh, two books in the New Testament, 1 Timothy and Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 6 of both of those books. If you need a Bible, just raise your hands. The ushers will be happy to give you one. And by the way, while they're handing out Bibles, let me remind you of our ministry called Postscript. If at any point during the message I say something that prompts a question, you can text that question to the number on the screen or you can email it in. And uh, in a video that we produce after the message, I'll take up those questions and try to address them at length in the course of the video. Before we jump into the sermon, though, let's uh, take a minute and pray together. Father, we're grateful for the privilege that we have to gather into your house, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, to worship him, to renew our love and our commitment to him. We're grateful for the presence of your Holy Spirit and how that spirit empowers us to be the people that you've called us to be. And we pray now that that same spirit would come just as you promised to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So as I was saying, we we do have a very special relationship with stuff. If you think about it, it's really rather remarkable, the amount of time and energy that we use to acquire, maintain, and use our stuff. And so today we want to look and see what does the Bible have to say about our relationship with our stuff? But before we do that, I want to lay a foundation for us by taking a look at another relationship. I want us to consider for just a few minutes our relationship with God. Because for Christians anyway, this is our primary relationship. It it is supposed to be the most important relationship in our lives. The, The one, in fact, that informs every other relationship that we may have. And from beginning to end, the Bible is quite clear that our relationship with God is to be based on faith. We are to have a trust-based relationship with God. God desires that we look to Him to do, to be, to provide for us everything which we cannot be or do or provide for ourselves. And as I said, from beginning to end, Scripture makes this very, very clear. Uh, Starting in the book of Genesis, Abraham is lifted up for us as a role model. Scripture says that he believed God, and because of his belief, that was credited to him as righteousness. The writer of the Proverbs encourages us to trust in the Lord and not to lean on our own understanding, put our faith in God. And then moving a little further on into the New Testament, Paul reminds the Corinthian believers that Christians walk by faith, not by sight. And then toward the end of the New Testament, toward the end of the Bible, the writer of of the the book of Hebrews gives us what is perhaps the most forceful word in all of the scriptures about our faith relationship with God. He says, it's impossible to please God without faith. That faith is the one thing that we absolutely cannot do without. If if we're going to seek God, if we're going to pursue God, we have to believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek after Him. Faith is the absolute essential 
in our relationship with God. And God desires this relationship from us. It's, it's not as though he, he puts it out there as an option for us. No, it's considered to be the norm. It's what God wants from us. It's the kind of relationship that God wants to enter into with each one of us, where we freely acknowledge that we are incomplete and insufficient apart from him. And as we choose as an act of our will to place our faith in him, he will provide for us all that we could otherwise not provide for ourselves. In my journeys uh, overseas, I've had the opportunity to see this faith relationship with God uh, be put to the test in the most literal ways possible. Several years ago, I had the privilege of traveling up into the far reaches of northern India, and I spent some time in uh, a village there in northern India with some brothers and sisters in Christ who lived in conditions like this. Uh, very, very difficult living conditions. And I observed these people as they prayed, give us this day our daily bread. It was not some nice recitation of a memorized prayer. No, when they prayed, give us this day our daily bread, they meant it. And the reason they meant it is because if God did not provide it, it wasn't coming from anywhere else. There was no grocery store. There was no bakery. There was no anywhere else for them to run and get bread. Either God was going to provide it for them or it was not going to happen. These people were living day by day in a very serious and a very real faith relationship with God. And as I compared my life to theirs, quite naturally, my faith relationship with God was called into question. Like you, I was born into a culture where, honestly, in all of my 52 years, I, I cannot say that I have ever wondered whether or not I would have bread the next day. There's never been a night in my life where I have gone to bed wondering, will there be something to eat tomorrow? I will confess to you, there have been times that uh, perhaps I've gone to bed wondering, is there any milk in the refrigerator? Am I going to have to get up first and go to the grocery store and get milk for everybody? I've gone to bed wondering if uh, the latest gadget that I ordered from Amazon would perhaps show up tomorrow. I spent time wondering about whether or not I ought to run out and get a new iPhone, but never have I ever wondered, would I have something to eat tomorrow? There's no getting around the fact that you and I live in a land of abundance. We have more than enough to meet not only our basic needs, but really there's plenty left over for all sorts of other things as well. But... The fact that we live in a land of material blessing does not exempt us from living by faith any more than our third world brothers and sisters. God expects that you and I, in spite of our affluence and in spite of the abundance that surrounds us, God expects that we will live by faith as well. And so here's the question for the day. How does one in an affluent culture live by faith? What does that look like? What does it even mean for those of us who really don't spend much time worrying about our basic needs? How do we exhibit an ongoing and active faith in God? What is it about the use of and the relationship that we have with our stuff that says to the rest of the world, I'm trusting God? to do for me. I'm trusting God to provide for me. How is it that we as a people who have economic opportunities and job opportunities like no other place in the world where provision is ample, how do we live in such a way that not only do we profess with our mouths that we trust in God, but we actually are living out a faith-based life? It's a challenging thing to do. And so I want us to take some time and consider what God's Word has to say about that today. 
Before we can answer the question honestly, though, I, I think there are two biblical truths that we need to look at, two truths that if we can get a, a handle on these truths, I think we will be much better equipped to evaluate our own relationship with stuff and how that particular relationship impacts our relationship with God. And the first of those biblical truths is this. Stuff has the power to destroy our relationship, our faith in God. Stuff has the power to destroy our faith in God. In his uh, letter to his young protege, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, the Apostle Paul wrote these words. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. You know, at the root of every temptation is the idea that this thing which is, is tempting me is offering me something that God either cannot or will not do for me. It, it's claiming that it, it can do something for me that God cannot or will not do. It's saying to us, you don't have to depend upon God. Matter of fact, you need to take matters into your own hands. That's the way to true happiness and contentment and getting whatever it is that you want. It's an age-old lie. In fact, it was the very first lie that was ever spoken. It was the same temptation that the serpent used with Adam and Eve in the garden. God had forbidden Adam and Eve from partaking of the fruit. He said to them, don't eat of it, for in the day that you do, you shall surely die. But along comes the serpent and begins to plant these doubts by saying to Adam and Eve, look, you're not going to die. I mean, that is so overblown. Really? No. The fact of the matter is this, God is holding out on you. You see, God knows that if you eat of this fruit, you're going to be just like him. Your eyes are going to be open and you are going to be able to see the difference between good and evil. I'm offering you something that God simply will not offer you. And Adam and Eve pondered it a bit and decided, hey, I think he's got something here. Let's go for it. And we've been paying the price ever since. The unique temptation of stuff is that it comes along and convinces us that we need to be self-sufficient. We say to ourselves, look, I, I've got to take control of the situation here. Nobody else is looking out for me. I've got to get ahead in this world. I'm responsible for uh, for myself, for my family. Nobody else is going to provide for our needs. And so I've just got to get busy here and do it. And we convince ourselves that we need stuff. We need all kinds of stuff. And I suppose the only thing worse than desiring lots of stuff is actually getting it. Because in that moment, that we get whatever it is our hearts desire, you know, the thing that we so desperately want, in that moment, we step over an invisible line, a very dangerous line, where we go from thinking, I need to be self-sufficient to a place of declaring, I am self-sufficient. I can take care of myself. I don't need God I have proven I can provide for me and for my family. And so there's no need for me to hunger for, thirst after, maintain this relationship with God because I can take care of me. And that begins a very dangerous chain of events. Notice in verse 9 the progression of events that Paul outlines for us. First, he says, we fall into temptation. When our heart's desire is on the pursuit of riches and the pursuit of stuff, we fall into temptation. Well, 
everybody falls now and again, and there's not necessarily any harm done as long as we're able to get back up, repent, and go the other way. But if we don't get back up, and if we continue to move down this path of pursuing stuff, we move from a fall to becoming senseless, Paul says, unthinking, stupid, foolish. We lose that ability to discern between the difference of right and wrong. And then it's just a matter of time before we fall, become senseless, that we take a plunge. You know, over the years, I have observed that most everybody can get back up from a fall. But I don't see too many people coming back from a plunge. I mean, if you think about it, falls are generally accidental. I don't think anybody gets up in the morning thinking, I believe I'll take a fall today. But plunge is willful. It's a decision. It's something that we decide we are going to do. And the consequences are often horrendous. I have a friend from childhood who... uh, in the years since we were little boys playing together, has soared to the heights of corporate America. And uh, along the way, he has received the bounty that comes with such an achievement. He has made it his pursuit. He has made it his life goal, and he has achieved that goal. But... Looking back on our days as little guys just running around in our little blue-collar, lower-class neighborhood, it has been both fascinating and sad to watch not only his ascent to financial prosperity, but his personal plunge as well. Today, he has wealth, no question about it. He remains a wealthy man, but what he does not have any longer is a family. He left them behind. And he no longer has his integrity because he was willing to make decisions that were dishonest in order to acquire that wealth. And saddest of all, he no longer has any semblance of a relationship with God. And verse 10 I'm afraid, is a terrifyingly accurate description of his life. Paul says those who pursue riches often wander from the faith and are pierced with many pangs. Make no mistake about it. If going after stuff, if pursuing wealth is the focal point of our lives, if that's what we're putting our energies toward, if that's what we truly desire, it is a dangerous, dangerous place. And it has both the power and the potential to destroy our faith in God. But that's not the final word. Because there's a second biblical truth that I think we need to understand as well. And the second truth is that stuff can also be used to build our faith in God. Stuff can also be used to build our faith. In his Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 19, Jesus said these words, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, wherever we put our treasures, whatever it is we choose to do with our stuff, will ultimately shape the person that we become. Wherever we put our treasures, our heart is sure to follow. Jesus is encouraging us to lay our treasures up in heaven, not only because it's a safe investment, not only because moth and rust and thieves will have no access to it, but more importantly, Jesus is saying, put your treasures in the things of God because that will ultimately shape the man or woman that you will one day become. 
It has that kind of influence in our lives. And when we choose to invest in the things of God, we become interested in the things of God. But when we choose to invest in stuff, when we choose to make stuff the priority of our lives, that sets the trajectory for the individual that we will ultimately become. And Jesus is simply speaking forth something here that all of us know to be true. Perhaps we've even observed along the way. Think about it. Think about someone you know who has made their investment in toys. I mean, that's what they're all about. When you think of this person, they are all about the latest this and that, whether it's houses or cars or boats or property or gadgets or whatever the case may be, toys are their thing. We know this kind of person because uh, we observe they spend an inordinate amount of time in the planning and purchasing and storing and using and taking care of, and worst of all, boring the rest of us to tears talking about their stuff. They live for their stuff. I like what George Carlin said once about accumulating a lot of stuff in order to be happy. He said, buying a lot of things in order to be happy is like taping sandwiches to your body in order to satisfy hunger. It's an inside thing. It doesn't work with external objects. Or think about the person you know who's made their life investments in the stock market. That's what they're all about. You know, toy schmoys. I'm weighing with the big boys now. I'm on Wall Street and that's where I am. We know these people because rather obsessively they're pulling their phone out every 15 minutes to see what the market is doing. And we know what kind of mood they're going to be in based on what the market is doing. If it's up, they're up, and if it's down, they are way down. Life is not good. But the good news is this. Jesus is saying it works the other way too. The same principle holds true for spiritual matters. If you invest in the things of God, if that is the focal point of your life, if you entrust Him with what you have, you're going to be interested in the things of God. His desires will be your desires. His priorities will be your priorities. And over time, as you invest in the things of God, you're going to begin to discover that your heart is being shaped and formed in ways that look like Him. And not in the ways of things that one day will be gone and gone forever. I'm thinking of a a Faithbridge family who have uh, given me permission to to share with you a bit of their story. By any measure, this is a wealthy family. They have many material blessings. Uh, They could probably live anywhere that they wanted to live, drive whatever they wanted to drive. They could probably play every day for the rest of their lives and not give it a second thought. But that's not the way they choose to live. As a matter of fact, they live very modestly. And the reason they do so is because they have made the conscious decision to lay their treasures up in heaven. They've decided that rather than accumulating a lot of stuff that will one day be gone, they're going to invest in the eternal. Years ago, when they were first coming into their wealth, so to speak, they were approached by a man by the name of Bill Bright. That name may be familiar to some of you. Dr. Bright was the founder of of Campus Crusade for Christ, one of the greatest ministries of the 20th, 21st century, reaching college students all over the world with the gospel. Dr. Bright approached this family and he challenged them to give a million dollars to advance the gospel on college campuses. Well, when they got over the shock of the request... They began to pray about it. And it wasn't as though at this point in their lives, they just had a million dollars laying around, a spare million to to, to give away. But as they prayed about it, they became convinced that God was calling them to do this, that God was putting this opportunity before them. And so they decided to take a step of faith and said, yes, we'll do it. And in due season, God did provide and they were able to make the gift. 
And I could tell you story after story of how God has used this family and their willingness to invest in him to make an impact on a global scale. There is a country in Eastern Europe, a former Soviet-dominated satellite, who for years, of course, based their educational system on atheistic principles, fundamental to communism. But after the Berlin Wall fell and freedoms came and doors opened, God laid before this family a chance to influence the educational system of this country. But it was going to be an investment and no guarantees. But they took a step of faith. And because they took that step of faith, today generations of young people are growing up in a formerly communistic, atheistic country, learning basic principles of the gospel and gaining a godly worldview and having the chance to become followers of Jesus Christ. There's a ministry called Faith Comes by Hearing. It's a ministry that takes the words of the Bible and produces an audio version so that persons who are either blind or illiterate have the chance to appreciate, to receive and be changed by God's word. This family took a risk and invested in this fledgling ministry. And as a result today, millions of people all around the globe who otherwise would have no access to God's word are able to turn on a little machine and hear the Bible, something that all of us who are sighted and can read take for granted. As wonderful as all of those things are, as great a blessing it is as it has brought to millions of people around the world, let me tell you the most important thing of it all. Number one, their hearts are being changed. But number two, they are living out faith in the midst of affluence. They are living, breathing examples of what it means to step up and say, God, I don't know how on earth I'm going to give a million dollars to this ministry, but I'm going to trust you to do it. I don't know how in the world I'm going to impact an educational system of an entire nation, but I'm going to take that step of faith. I don't know how I'm going to help illiterate and blind people have access to the word of God, but I'll trust you. Their faith is growing because they are choosing to invest in eternal things rather than in toys and their hearts are being shaped. And I would count this family to be among the godliest people I know. In fact, I would count the dad even to be a, a, a spiritual father for me in my own growth as a Christian. And they would be the first to tell you that it's not because of anything wonderful they have done, but rather it's because of the opportunities that God has laid before them. Now, perhaps you're saying to yourself, well, pfft, good for them, Pastor Dan, but I don't see no million dollars coming from my pocketbook anytime soon. Well, hear me out on this. God could not care less about the amount. That is so not his area of interest. I mean, do we really think that there is any amount of money in the world that's going to impress God? That's going to make him step back and say, wow, I'm glad you're on my team. <laughs> not a chance. Fishes and loaves, God can take the smallest amount and do what he wants to impact and change the world. It's not the amount that God's interested in. It is your heart and what your heart is becoming over time through your relationship with your stuff. Perhaps the premier example of this is the widow. Jesus and his disciples were in the temple one day observing people making their offering. And he saw a group of wealthy people give out of their abundance with plenty left over. And then he saw a widow come up and drop two copper coins, all that she had, into the offering plate. And he turned to his disciples and said, she gave more than all the rest. And being very literal minded, the disciples are like, how do you think, Jesus? Uh, it doesn't add up. He said, because she gave out of faith. She gave what she had, trusting that God would take care of her. God would provide for her. So it comes down to a choice, doesn't it? 
Those of us who are blessed to live here in this land of bounty, it comes down to a choice. Will we live in such a way that our relationship with stuff ultimately destroys our faith? Or will we live in such a way that God can use it to build our faith? You know, not even Jesus was exempt from this choice. Granted, Jesus had no material possessions except the clothes on his back. The only thing that Jesus had was his life. And yet when God called for that life and asked for Jesus to make a decision of faith, what did he do? He said, not my will, but yours. And he allowed his body to be broken. When God said, Jesus, I want what you have, and all he had to give was his blood, he said, not my will, but yours. And as a result, you and I received the greatest gift ever, the gift of renewal, forgiveness, and eternal life. Because we never know what can happen when we hand what we have to Almighty God. In just a moment, we're going to gather here at the table. And as we gather at this table, I want to challenge you, I want to encourage you to think and to think diligently about your relationship with stuff. And let the Holy Spirit examine your heart and reveal to you which choice are you making? Is yours a faith destroying relationship or is yours a faith building relationship? In just a moment, the ushers are going to guide us down to the front where we have several stations. You'll find pieces of bread in a basket and we'll ask you to take a, a piece of that bread and dip it in the cup and then partake. And afterward, you're welcome to stay here at the front and pray on the stairs if that's a need. We've got prayer partners who will be glad to come and pray with you. If uh, gluten is uh, an issue for you, there's a gluten-free station over to my right, to your left. You can make your way over there. But as you come, please come in a spirit of prayer and in a spirit of openness to let God say to you what he will. Will you pray with me, please? Father, we confess to you that uh, simply by virtue of living where we do, the temptation to put our faith in stuff is so strong. It can seem so appealing and so secure. And yet in the face of all that, you stand before us and say, I will be your provision. I will meet your needs. I will care for you if you but put your faith in me. So we're asking you today, Lord, as we partake of the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ, give us grace to choose what is best, to turn our backs on those things that are fleeting and finite and to willingly embrace the eternal so that you would be glorified, so that the world would be changed and so that our hearts would become more and more like you. We pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, and I'm here with Pastor Dan Slagle, who just brought us part four of Wisdom for Life. Today, we talked about stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Love the perspective on um, stuff that we talked about today, and actually brought up several questions that we have. So yeah. I'll just jump right in. Okay. Um, can Christians have wealth and stuff and still give and act as commanded? Is it wrong to desire 
both? Is that an unchristian behavior? Let, let me come at it this way. Uh, all Christians, it, it, most Christians anyway, already have stuff. M most everybody owns something. Mm -hmm. So it's really not a matter of whether or not you have stuff. The question really is, do, does the stuff have you? Mm, what, what, where is your heart in all of this? Is uh, the thing that you live for getting more stuff? Is that where sec your security is, your sense of happiness, your sense of well-being, peace? If those sorts of things are a part of the equation, then stuff is not serving a helpful role in your life. On the other hand, if stuff in your life is there to meet the needs of you and your family, to provide pleasure and enjoyment, there's nothing wrong with that, to serve God's purposes, it's perfectly fine to have stuff. The, the, the family that I referenced in the sermon, they pretty diligently pursue wealth. Uh, but it's not to build a kingdom. It's for the kingdom. And that's where they funnel most of their resources. And so I think uh, to the degree that we have those sort of checks and balances in our lives, there's no sin. Sin uh, Stuff is not inherently sinful. Okay. It's just the kind of relationship that we have with it. Good. And so that leads us into our second question that we had come in today. What about um, those with a shopping addiction? So how do you reconcile that with being a Christian? If you feel powerless to this need to acquire stuff and you usually get it, um, how can you how can you move from that? How can you be released from that and to make the right choices? Okay. Well, the first thing I would say is, is to get help. There are plenty of 12-step ministries out there. We have support group that meets here on Tuesday nights. Um, lots and lots of opportunities to get help for any kind of addiction uh, and shopping included. Taking that f first step to get help is, is what's really going to set one on a trajectory towards wholeness and, and healing. But then beyond that, I think... Um, Involving yourself in community here at Faith Bridge or wherever you worship on a regular basis can be a, a very big part of moving past this, enlisting the help of others mm -hmm. so that you begin to become more enamored with the things of God than with the latest article of clothing or gadget or, or whatever the case may be. It, it's really more a shifting of um, what you're in love with. And if you hang around people who are in love with God and let that love begin to impact your heart, you're going to find yourself, I think, quite naturally leaning that way. But at a minimum, find some place that can help you if it's a true addiction. Yeah, no substitute for that. That's great. Okay, so this was part four. And mm -hmm. next week we're going to be moving into part five, which Pastor Ken will be back to speak to us on Envy. Yeah. So um, thank you for your insights that we've had for the last couple of weeks sure. and for joining us here for Postscript. And thank you for your questions. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.